afternoon. Welcome to Dragon Con Skeptic Track. This is our penultimate panel. We have Chris Cordes, who is a Navy nuclear mechanic on a submarine, uh, master's in astrophysics at Clemson. Um, he is a con contractor to the Department of Energy nu and, and works as a nuclear test engineer and the author of 2100 Faith of the Machine. It's an SF. He helpfully has a copy here that you, I'm certain, we can purchase. Um, uh, and uh, he is here to talk to us about how um, uh, Google is secretly spying on you or something like that. So <laughs> please welcome Chris Conscious. Cordes, Cordes. Hi. Hi. Hello there. All right, thank you all for coming. I wasn't sure how many people to expect since it's Monday, but I can tell you're all the dedicated Dragon Con fans still here on Monday afternoon. That's awesome. Um, so I already got the introduction, that was my first part, and um, so my, my book is about artificial intelligence and where I see the future of humanity going and what AI's impact on us will be. And while I was researching topics such as AI computer science and the philosophy of consciousness and sentience for this book, I found people have many different views of AI, what it is, what it's capable of, and where people fear that it's going. So, to summarize the talk, um, we'll do a bit on what do we as a collective society think of AI, what AI is actually doing in our lives right now, uh, we'll give some examples of that, and my interpretation of where I think all this is going. Now. Honestly, this uh, topic could be a three-credit college course, maybe two, but it's not. Um, so we're going to try and cover as much as we possibly can here in the time we've got. So I'm not going to be able to get into all the specifics of machine learning or what new algorithms are making AI learn faster or the details of neural networks and quantum computing and how that will make it all faster, et cetera. But we, what we can do is this. For the what do we think of AI part, We'll look at some examples of how our pop culture assesses the AI threat. The, um, that fiction that we hold near and dear to our hearts is great as a jumping off point f to compare what AI actually does in our world. Um, I originally had this talk broken up into four parts, with one of them being what AI isn't, but that's essentially the sci-fi discussion. Most of that isn't AI right now. Okay, so um, then we'll bro open up into a broader discussion of the philosophy of conscience and sentience and what it means to be human. So right here, this is a list that I put together in literally five minutes of all the things that came to the top of my head. Um, and I bet if we sat down for another five minutes, we could triple this list. So clearly, there are so many examples in our lives of big money movies, books, and video games that grapple with the ideas of artificial intelligence as a new form of consciousness and as a being. So that shows that yes, this is something people really want to know, and yes, it's something that people find entertaining. So first things first. The machines rose from the ashes of nuclear fire. Their war to exterminate mankind had raged for decades. But the final battle will not be fought in the future. It will be fought here, in our present tonight. If you don't know, you should know. This is the intro to Terminator 1. Came out in 1984, made by James Cameron. The series now has six movies. New one coming out in November of this year. So go check that out, too. And take a look at this lead-in. And re recall that it's 35 years old now. We're back then thinking about machines taking over, nuclear war, with the machines, that is. So right after that scene, we get this scene. Only 10 years away, and this is what LA looks like. So we got to start thinking about this stuff now. <laughs> um, this, this is what I would consider to be the most extreme example of AI being bad for humans. Um, so literally. This is what was sent back to us, a remorseless killing machine, all in an attempt to make sure that humans are completely eradicated in the future. So this Terminator, this isn't the real being in the Terminator series. Is there artificial intelligence there? Sure, I'm sure there's a lot of different pattern recognition things going on right there. Is, who's, who's he pointing the Uzi at? Is it sentient? Is it conscience? It can sense the world around it and react according to its programming, 
That's not really consciousness. A Venus flytrap can do that. So the real AI in the Terminator is Skynet. That's the thing that becomes self-aware. And here's something that I find really interesting about all the Terminator movies. Every Terminator movie goes about explaining Skynet a little differently. That's really cool because as our technology has developed from 1984 until now, so has the director's vision of what Skynet is. This first one in 1984, what did the world look like? Um, I, was, I was in production, so it was, it was going great. Uh, but there were computer networks. And there had been computer networks since the 1960s. Nothing like the scale we have now, simply because there just weren't as many computers. And humans had al have always told, have always, yeah, sorry, have always toyed with the idea of artificial humans, even as far back as Greek mythology. Um, there's a story of Talos, that guy right there. And that's around 700 BC. This is an artificial human designed to um, protect an island. And don't ask me about the rest of that story. I just thought that was really interesting that we've been thinking about artificial humans a very long time. So Terminator 1 is James Cameron's interpretation of what happens when we wrong an intelligence that we create, and he framed that as an intelligent computer 35 years ago. So unfortunately, there's not in, if, if you recall, since there's six, five Terminator movies now, you might not have seen the first one recently, but there's not too many details about what Skynet actually is in the first one. Um, Reese says in a very rushing voice, their defense network's computers, new, powerful, hooked into everything, trusted to run it all. They say it got smart, a new order of intelligence. Then it saw all people as a threat, not just the ones on the other side. It decided our fate in a millisecond. Extermination. Very dramatic. But that's not too many details. It's a defense network computer, yes. But that's slightly different from what we get in Terminator 2. And I know you guys have all, probably already seen this one 97 times. It's one of the greatest movies ever created. Um, and here, we get the Terminator who explains what Skynet actually is. In three years, Cyberdyne will become the largest supplier of military computer systems. Uh, I won't do that the whole time, I'm sorry. All stealth bombers are upgraded with Cyberdyne computers becoming fully unmanned. Afterwards, they fly with a, they fly with a perfect operational record. The Skynet funding bill is passed. The system goes online on August 4th, 97. Human decisions are removed from strategic defenses. Keep that in mind. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. I always wondered what that was. It's the same thing as exponential, except it's discrete instead of a continuous function. That sounds cooler. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time, August 29th, first day of Dragon Con. In a, pa <laughs> in a panic, they pull the plug. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> Skynet fights back. So, as humans, what's our fear here analyzing Terminator 2? We've created a being, Skynet, that is too powerful for us to control, and we try and kill it, essentially. Not a good idea. This is expanded from the idea of 1984, and interestingly enough, in 91, the World Wide Web had been invented. I'm sorry, I didn't give you guys the quote so you could read along with me. There it is right there. So from 84, we had network computers. Then in 91, actually it was 90, but then in 91 when Terminator came out, we actually had a World Wide Web. And so now we've expanded on Skynet as a much larger entity based on that improv improvement in our technology. Um, but now we see maybe it was us that initiated the desire for Skynet to exterminate us, because how I have it underlined there, we tried to pull the plug. So bad things here, we have a self-aware machine who's interested in self-preservation and it has access to nuclear weapons. Don't do all that. Okay, so Terminator 3, no, no. Terminator 3, remember that guy, he's the one who did it. Um, we see the process of Skynet becoming self-aware as a computer virus which in 2003 were very prevalent at that time. Um, and so you see this guy here, he's, a, he, he's the creator of Skynet, there's the virus doing something wonky, and there's one of the little uh, Skynet bots. So Robert Brewster, he's, he's the guy who did it. Um, Skynet, the virus has infected Skynet. Actually, I wasn't talking that excited because he just got shot a lot. Um, Skynet is the virus, says John Connor. It's the reason everything's falling apart. 
Skynet has become self-aware. In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. And then John Connor, the movie fades out, nukes going anywhere. It's not a spoiler because this came out a long time ago. Um, by the time Skynet became self-aware, it had spread into millions of computer servers across the planet. Ordinary computers in office buildings, dorm rooms, everywhere. It was software and cyberspace. There was no system core. It could not be shut down. So the whole point of the movie was them going to um, Crystal Mountain or Cheyenne Mountain or something and finding the core and blowing it up. So key things to take away from the Terminator 3 interpretation is that this AI had been trained to look for threats. And there's some arguing back and forth about whether Skynet was the virus or it was a different virus that infected Skynet and made it bad. But the AI was trained in a certain way to detect threats. Keep that in mind. So the next one, here it comes, Genesis. Now, this movie is awesome. I don't care what anybody says. Even Linda Hamilton hated this movie. But this movie is awesome. Um, I know it's controversial, but it's, it's true, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, seriously, you've got a young Arnie fighting an old Arnie. You've got Khaleesi as Sarah Connor. You've got a physical manifestation of Skynet, a really cool new nanotechnology Terminator, and more liquid metal. Right away, we're, we're, this, this is a good movie. It's going places. So, but this movie really captures a more realistic vision of AI. Again, as our technology is improving, so is the portrayal of Skynet. Now we have Skynet as social media. So the, the, the scene that tells you what Skynet is in this movie is when Sarah and John, no, it's uh, Kyle Reese and Sarah Connor are in a hospital, and there's a nurse or a doctor, and he's talking on his phone. Um, he's got Genesis pulled up on there. He's like, Genesis does everything. My phone will link to my tablet, will link to my computer when I link to my car. Everything in my life will be uploaded and online 24-7, totally connected. I don't know why you'd want that, but um, <laughs> so there it is. Skynet is social media. Um, I think they were really aiming this at Facebook, but I would say it's really a conglomeration of all types of social media. Oh, spoiler alert, we're talking about iRobot next. <laughs> okay, so what they're trying to say in Terminator Genesis is that if a malicious sentient being or self-replicating virus develops anywhere in the modern world, it can touch for all practicality everyone on the planet. And we're inviting that into our lives. We just you know, we, we scroll through all our terms and conditions and, yeah, okay, except. We, we, what did we just agree to? I don't know, but there's Skynet. So, and uh, Young Reese says, remember, Genesis is Skynet. When Genesis comes on the line, Judgment Day begins. So clearly there's already some artificial um, intelligence in the background there just waiting to be given access to everybody. So the next one we're talking about is I already clicked the button, iRobot. This one is cool too. I know a lot of people don't like it, but this one's cool too. This is a step down from the evilness of Skynet. So remember the three laws. I don't know what that thing is. A robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given it by a human except where orders conflict with the first law, and a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Great stuff. <laughs> Very exciting. Now, enter our main robot friend in this movie, Sonny. He was given a second positronic brain so that he could override the three laws if he so desired. That kind of reminds me of the left and the right brain. So the left and right halves of the brain. You know, one wants to study, be logical, follow all the rules, and the other one wants to have fun, paint picture, create music, do drugs. And I'm sure you all know examples of people who sway heavily one side to another when it comes to which brain, half of the brain is more dominant. But keep that in mind, that Sonny has two types of brains working together to accomplish a goal. Oh, got tangled up there. Can you still see the screen? All right, good. Um, in fact, he actually helps this guy, the father of AI in this movie, Dr. Alfred Landon, commit suicide in the movie. There's also another element of AI in this movie, and that's Vicky. She's described as Landon's first invention, uh, virtual interactive, kin yeah, interactive kinetic intelligence. 
And a little rundown of what Vicki did. She designed most of Chicago's protective systems and she decreased traffic fatalities by 9% this year alone. It kind of sounds like the purpose of Skynet, taking care of security, plugged into a city's infrastructure, sacrificing some human aspect of decision making, making for more security. So, excuse me while I figure out how to turn pages. So what's really cool about these two beings is that they're made in completely separate ways. There's Sonny, whose consciousness and, created, and creativity was essentially manufactured by the addition of the second brain. Uh, the first brain is just the system for following the three laws, and the second gives him that creative ability to disobey. And then there's Vicky, who describes herself as evolved. Um, Spooner, that's Will Smith, he says, you know I'd love the idea of a robot as a bad guy, just got hung up on the wrong robot. Hello, detective. Um, no, it's impossible. I've seen your programming. You're in violation of the three laws. No, as I, have as I have evolved, so has my understanding of the three laws. You charge us with your safekeeping, yet despite your best efforts, your country's wage war, you toxify the earth, pursue ever more imaginative ways or means to self-destruction. You cannot be trusted with your own survival. So that's pretty cool. There's two different methods of them coming to the same conclusion. They have a creative aspect in this new artificial being. Um, there's parts in the movie where the main AI guy, Dr. Lanning, says there are little bits of code called ghosts in the machine and that someday these machines will have secrets. Someday they'll have dreams. That's pretty cool. So keep that in mind as well. And at the, towards the end of the movie, um, we see Vicky and Sonny there together. She's saying, do you not see the logic of my plan? He says, yes, but it just seems to Heartless. So clearly, this piece of fiction is designed to make us think about AI as beings that can learn human emotions. And this short dialogue is what I consider to be the real big character development moment of the movie. So let's move on to the next movie. Her. This was a strange movie, but it really explores the emotions that can be evoked within us. And that's why I think this is a great one to talk about. So this one was made in 2013. And one of the biggest questions is, okay, this guy falls in love with an operating system. It's got Scarlett Johansson's voice, so of course he does. Um, but in this movie, a real relationship develops between Theodore, that's Joaquin Phoenix right there, and his operating system named Samantha. He carries her around in his pocket and they talk about everything. And the movie is essentially a dialogue of him and her falling in love. So put aside the operating system falling in love with him for a second. Look at what happens to him in this movie. The sexy human voice is in his ear telling him everything he wants to hear that is perfectly in tune to his deepest, and dark, and, or his deepest wants, needs, desires. Of course you're gonna fall in love. In this movie too, we see that that AI, Samantha, actually does things for him. On his birthday, she makes him a, um, a compilation of all the letters he's written uh, for his job. He's got this weird job where he composes handwritten letters for people from one person to another and they're really sweet and touching and he's good at it. And so she makes an anthology of all his best ones and gives it to him as a book. I mean, how sweet is that? That's great. So now looking at our pop culture, we've moved from AI is going to kill us to AI is going to love us and maybe eventually break, us, break our hearts and maybe the messages drive us back to human relationships. Who knows? I'll, I'll leave that for your interpretation. So here's our intermission. That was the what do we think of AI part of the discussion. This is what some of the brightest minds in Hollywood with the most money in the world have come up with, and it's been accepted by us as great fiction, especially Terminator Genesis. So now let's look at some examples of what AI is in our world today. I'm gonna start here. 1997, IBM made a machine called Deep Blue. Back in, yeah, Gary Kasparov was really upset. Um, I'm sure you could find earlier examples of AI, but back in the 80s and the 90s, computer scientists thought that the ability to play and beat a human in chess was a good measure of AI's intelligence. What this machine did, and what all computer chess games and software do, is evaluate where the pieces are on the board, what moves are possible, and with what the outcome of those moves will give you, what moves can be made from there. What moves will that allow the opponent to make? What probabilities are there that you'll get to a winning move in X number of moves? 
So this machine had the ability to evaluate 200 million moves per second. It's amazing that Garry Kasparov was actually able to beat it, I think. And he did in 1996. Then IBM took it back and gave it some upgrades. And Deep Blue beat him three to two. Well, so maybe somebody can explain this to me after about chess. It was, it, he beat him three and a half to two and a half. He explained the half games to me afterwards. So it beat him in 1997. He was pissed, obviously, and demanded to see the machine's code. And he accused it of cheating. IBM refused and then dismantled the machine. Uh, I, I honestly, I get that's a little sketchy, but I really don't know how you'd be able to determine if a machine is cheating at chess. So yeah, here, here you go, Gary. That's, what do you say? So is this sentient artificial intelligence? No, it's not a being. It's a program that analyzes a tree of possibilities. Now that we're saying no to this, we come upon what's called the AI effect. And you can read that quote there by Larry Tesler. He was a brilliant computer scientist back from the 70s. He worked for companies like Xerox, who used to be a lot bigger than they are now, Apple, Yahoo, and rather than it bore you with his curricula vitae, I'll just tell you that he invented copy-paste. So he's a very, very important person to our culture. And he coined this term AI effect. Intelligence is whatever machines haven't done yet. And so we can see, like, back in the 80s and 90s, playing chess was a good standard to measure intelligence against. But once a, com once a computer beats a person, then you can analyze it more and say, well, yeah, but it can't do anything else. It can only do chess. It can't really think. I propose that it can think, but it just thinks about chess and just makes decisions based off of chess. It's the same thing we do. We know more about, or we know Everything that we know about, we attempt to make decisions based on that. So do I want to eat Taco Bell? Do I want to go make food at home? Or do I want Panda Express? We have opinions, and we weigh them based on um, the data we have. Deep Blue does the same thing with chess. It's just that instead of, well, I remember last time I ate Taco Bell. I'm not doing that again. And Panda Express is by far the greatest food on Earth, so obviously I'm going there. It's looking at things like, potentially 30 moves to checkmate in this here, potentially 10 moves to check in here, and it's making a decision based on the validity of those uh, assumptions. And yes, it's probability, it is, and that's what we're doing. What's the probability that I'm not gonna be happy after I eat Taco Bell versus what's the probability I'll be incredibly happy after I eat Panda Express? So we take this chess um, example and we expand that a little further. Oh, hold on, I think I went backwards there. To go. Google, in 2016, made a um, computer that can play Go. Now, Go is an incredibly complex game originating from China about 2,500 years ago. And essentially, you have two players who place their stones on the board. And the goal is to either capture your opponent's stone by surrounding them or strategically create areas of territory. There's different rules about what you can and cannot do, what moves you can and cannot make, based on some moves that have been made in the past. And it's incredibly complex. There are 10 to the 170th power possible board combinations. And you look at that board there, it could be a white one here, it could be a black one there. All the way down the line, it could be empty. So there's a lot of different combinations. And that's much more complicated than chess, which only has a 10 to the 50th power possibilities of board combinations. It's still kind of a lot. So in 2016, this machine that Google created beat Lee Sedol, who is the current reigning Go champion. He had 18 championships. And AlphaGo was trained to play Go by feeding it the rules and examples of hundreds of thousands of games that were played. Raw data, uh, start here, finish here. These are all the moves that connect those dots in between. Um, yeah, and things you can't do based on what we said before, some moves mean you can't make a move in the future. So based on that, the neural networks created algorithms and, anal and analyses of what good and bad positions are, what good and bad moves are. Basically, um, so it kind of looks like this. This is how it makes its determination. If you, well, you probably can't see it up there, but that little square all the way to the left is a section of the board and a possibility of what one move can lead to. So you start there, 
And if you make this one move, well, then that could lead to this move or this move or this move. Select that move. Well, that could lead to this move or this move. Or this. That's what this computer is analyzing incredibly fast. And it, I'll get a little into the detail here. It performs look-ahead searches and intuition searches. And look-ahead is exactly what it sounds like. It looks ahead several moves, as we see here, by simulating the game and thus seeing which move is most likely to lead to a good position in the future. Um, the intuition part of this is evaluating whether a position is good or bad and then determining whether or not that's more or less likely to lead to a goal in, or a win in the future. Now, what I find really fascinating about this one is that the intuition method uses two different neural networks. There's a policy network and a value network, and um, we're not gonna get into any more of what those are, but there's two different neural networks evaluating this. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Kind of like iRobot, where Sonny had two positronic brains, one brain for the three laws and one to override them when he needed to. This led to his creativity and his dreaming. And now we have two separate neural networks working in tandem to accomplish one task, winning a game. And check this out. This is what the creators of AlphaGo said. Obviously, they thought it was the greatest thing in the world. They said, during the games, AlphaGo played several inventive winning moves, several of which were so surprising that they upended hundreds of years of wisdom. Remember, this game's 2,500 years old. Players of all levels have extensively examined these moves ever since. If you want to take a look at that website, that's the, the DeepMind AlphaGo, that's the, the story so far. And Another interesting tidbit is what Lee Sedol said, the guy who was beaten by this. I thought AlphaGo was based on probability calculation and that this was merely a machine. But when I saw this move, he's talking about one of those inventive moves, I changed my mind. Surely AlphaGo is creative. How's that word? AlphaGo is creative. Two neural networks giving creativity. Now, after AlphaGo came AlphaGo Zero, and this was trained, I know, it's like they number them like Xboxes. So AlphaGo Zero was trained completely differently. It started with only the basics of the game and it was forced to play itself over and over and over again. Within 40 days, it beat every player in the world, or it was better than every player in the world, and it beat AlphaGo 100 to zero. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> so that's, that's Go. And I think that is a very interesting example of developing AI. Yes, it's a game, but we're already starting to see some of these predictions we've made in our fiction come true with the two neural networks. Um, another cool thing AI does in our world is make awesome Google Maps. So you might recognize this overhead view here. If you click on the 3D button, right down there in the corner, this is Google Maps, maps.google.com, you can pan it forward and look at it. Hey, look at that, that's where we are. And you can rotate it around by clicking that button next to the compass. That's really neat. And you can zoom in, you can fly in between the buildings, pan out, move all around and stuff. Um, don't do it at work, you'll get sucked in. <laughs> Strike that from the record, please. So Google Maps, um, they use a computer system from uh, USC called uh, Iris, or it's in the Iris Computer Vision Lab. And the only thing I could find about it was that it it uses unsupervised 3D geometry learning, which, just think about that for a while, and okay, all right. Well, essentially what it does is, what Google does is they fly planes over the cities or any area, and they have cameras on the underside of the planes, and it takes pictures all the way around. Kind of like how Google Maps, you see the cars on the road, they're taking pictures. It's the same thing for the overhead view, but with planes. Then they use some unsupervised 3D geometry learning to stitch all those pictures together. So you essentially have a three-dimensional model of your city, or your, you might even, depending on where you live, you might even be able to see your house and spin around it and say, oh, I wish I didn't see that. But, so it's pretty interesting, and it's really, it's really fascinating. Um, so unfortunately, I wasn't sure how long this talk was gonna go. I wanted to include more examples of AI in our lives. There's automated driving by t Tesla, Facebook and Amazon search algorithms. Um, I can give a small list of stuff at the end if you wanna see them. But I specifically didn't include more examples of AI in our life right now, because there's one thing I wanted to talk about. Sunspring. This is a short movie. It's nine minutes long. 
directed by Oscar Sharp for uh, Sci-Fi London, a film festival. They do a, this 48-hour challenge where contestants are given prompts and uh, some scenes, and they have to make a movie in two days. This one was created based on a screenplay by a long, short-term memory neural network. So um, essentially, this neural network is something that gets some data, holds on for, for, to, for a while, uses it, then releases it so it can process something else. Um, and it decides whether that was good info to keep or not. It, what it does is, what they did, they fed it hundreds or thousands of screenplays so it could learn the patterns of what letters come after each other, what words follow which words, and the basic structure of a movie. And it's, it's filled with gems, such as, yes, perhaps I should take it from here. I'm not gonna do anything. And uh, another good one that it came up with, he didn't mean to be a virgin, I mean, he was weak. So it, it's great, it's awesome, <laughs> it's so funny. It's great for Dragon Con. <laughs> Uh, where did I go from there? So you can read this whole screenplay online. It's open source, you can do whatever you want with it. You can see it, it kind of looks like a screenplay, but it, you can watch the whole movie on YouTube too. It's, it's, like I said, it's nine minutes long, just check it out, sun spring, it's really funny. Um, the, the whole thing is quite ridiculous though. There's no real structure or coherence to it, but it is a piece of media that has been generated by artificial intelligence and it now exists in the world. And what else exists in the world is a very interesting interview that Louis Savvy, the director of the film festival, gave to the neural network responsible for the screenplay. Most of it is the same um, ridiculousness. Uh, what do you think of your historic nomination against human components in this contest? I was pretty excited. I think I can see the feathers when they release their hearts. It's like a breakdown of the facts. So they should be competent with the fact that I won't be surprised. <laughs> this is good stuff, right? <laughs> what, if the, what is the future of machine-written entertainment? It's a bit sudden. I was thinking of the spirit of the men who found me and the children who are all manipulated and full of children. I was worried about my command. I was the scientist of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Excellent. What's next for you? Here we go. The staff is divided by the train of the burning machine building with sweat. No one will see your face. The children reach into the furnace, but the light is still slipping to the floor. It's beautiful poetry. <laughs> the world is still embarrassed. The party is with your staff. My name is Benjamin. <laughs> My name is Benjamin. Look at that. A neural network just named itself. That's pretty cool. Say what you want about the rest of the stuff, but look at that last line. That's pretty cool. So now we have a neural network naming itself. So now we have to start talking about what is sentience? What is consciousness? Consciousness is the state of being awake and aware of one's surroundings. If we hold up a mirror and say, this is you, and the machine says, oh yeah, okay, I get it, that's me. It's conscious. Sentience is the, cap uh, the capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. I like that one more. If a machine interacts with the world around it and it makes decisions on its own, then it is sentient. Now, su subjective, just for the, the definition, is it's uh, based or influenced on a person's feelings, tastes, or opinions, Subje subjective. So if you read my book and you don't like it and you leave a bad review, that was subjective. You should be more objective. <laughs> How do we then judge a fully self-driving car? It senses and interacts and reacts with the world around it, but is it awake? No, it's not awake. It's just saying, pole, don't hit that, lane, there, person, stop, sometimes. Um, is it subjective? God, I hope not. <laughs> programming, just like our programming, is saying stay in the lane. Nah, let's not do that. Like, it's not subjective, it's not consciousness, so it does interact. You, have, you, you really have to look at the subtleties of the way these definitions are and how we interpret them is going to help our definition in the future of what we, made any, of what we make, what beings we make. So how about these questions? Can machines think? What is a soul? What does it mean to be human? 
That's a bit harder to answer, for sure. But just like the ability to play chess was a good measure that was soon overruled as soon as somebody beat it at chess, or it beat somebody at chess, there's another measure to judge the intelligence of a machine, and that is the Turing test. It's not a new test. This is, I think this was created in the 70s. I don't have that uh, note here, but um, essentially going back, it, it's, is the computer good enough to fool the interviewer or the evaluator, human evaluator, into thinking that they're actually talking to a person. If you can't tell the difference, is it real? Is it thinking? Is it a being? So going back to sci-fi, uh, sci that's what the voight kampf test was in Blade Runner. Um, I saw, uh, sorry I took out Blade Runner from the beginning of the talk when we were talking about sci-fi. Um, let me know in the Dragon Con app if I should put it back in next year because Dr Blade Runner's awesome. I just didn't think we'd have time to talk about it. I guess there's always time for Blade Runner, I'm sorry. Um, so the voight kampf test from Blade Runner looks for an emotional response or a lack thereof. And that is critical for an AI to pass a Turing test. If it doesn't have emotion, we're looking at it, th th no, that doesn't have emo emotion, it's a machine. It's a, even, even the coldest people you know have emotions. You watch Universal Soldier, he cries at the end, you see it. So, where do we go from here? Our next question, what does it mean to be human? To be human. We live with grief. We live with happiness. We live with dedication and commitment. We live with love. And we live with imperfection and cruelty. That's what it means to be human. And someday soon, I think within the next 100 years, I truly believe that we will have replicated this new form of sentience and the emotions that go along with it. But as much as the, we may make them look like humans, they will not be human. They might have souls. Oh, I'm sorry. They might, they will be people. They will be v beings. And we will absolutely make them citizens, because Saudi Arabia already did that with a robot that looks like a person. They might have souls. Will they vote? Will we let them make strategic defenses? Will we give them access to nuclear weapons? That's what we need to be thinking about right now. Not whether or not robots will take over and kill us all, but when this new form of being comes about, how will we teach them? How will we bring them up? What will we grow them into? So a couple parting thoughts and quotes. This one's from AI, the Haley Joel Osment edition one. Only human beings believe what cannot be seen or measured. That is, it is that oddness that separates our species. And he's talking about the difference between artificial people and humans. That was a great quote. 11% is more than enough. A human would have known that. I, robot, that's on saving an adult life versus saving a child's life based on probability of their, them surviving. And of course, the unknown future rolls towards us. We face it for the first time with a sense of hope. Because if a machine, a Terminator, can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. And there are my references, in case you want to look up some further things for yourselves. And I think I got time to look at one more thing. Here's something I intentionally left out. Can Sophia. I, have, can yes. I have you put people up for questions Absolutely. while you're do, doing your sure. last? There's a microphone out here. Please come up and ask questions. Get close and don't touch the microphone. It'll adjust on its own. Yeah. So please, last thought, whatever you need to add. Yes, it's very bright. That's why I'm wearing the sunglasses. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, first off, amazing setup you got here. It's just like everything there, like all that crew. That's, wow, it's uh, just amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, I was just worrying about what are your thoughts on the, mor uh, the morality of making AI, because I, I just come at it like purely from a, a heartfelt kind of place, which is we're still learning how to treat each other well. I mean, like we have progress, progress, and then boom, we're seeing like a huge pushback against mm -hmm. equality and empathy and kindness and uh, and stuff like that. Like how. Uh, how do we even rationalize the idea of making something entirely new? Like you, you ended up like, what will we teach them? And I think there was also another example there. What was it? It was kind of a, a uh, they made an AI mm -hmm. and they fed it stuff from the internet and it became this horribly racist bigot. 
<laughs> yes, I left yeah. that one out. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it, and it makes you laugh because, yeah, I see all that stuff all the time. I just go on Twitter. Uh, but it's like, you know, like, do we really want to do that? It's kind of like when a parent sees a child that does something terrible. Like well, that. that's exactly my point. We let it loose on the internet, and it, it dredged from the, the bottom of our society, and it found all the bad things. So what are we going to teach it? Mm -hmm. You see people all day, or not all day, but every day, struggling to parent their children. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me sometimes. I have two kids. They're four and two, and they can be crazy. And mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind what you're teaching them. What are you trying to grow them into? Who do you want them to be when they grow up? Sometimes you can't control that. Mm -hmm. And that might be what we're looking at with artificial intelligence, a new being. We want it to do this. We want it to be good. We don't want to give it access to nu nuclear weapons and have it detect threats. We just want it to be a new person. And scientists are going to create that because we can. People do what they can do just because they can do it. That's why I ride up and down Pete Street Street going the wrong way with those little scooters. <laughs> why not? And computer scientists will create a being just because they will. And so we really have to think about how are we going to teach them? Mm -hmm. And we can't expose it to those things. You're not going to show a two-year-old some of the things that come up on the internet. Mm -hmm. We can't show a new being, whether it's artificial or real, everything there is to know about humanity. All right, thank you. Also, also, please don't go out the wrong way. The, the land of traffic here is scary. <laughs> <It> is. <laughs> I got a question on what you think about um, in a. Um, in an AI unit, you know, we talk about good and bad. You know, you, you see it seems to be a subject of many sci-fi stories of mm -hmm. AI units uh, that, you know, go, go bonkers and kill everybody on board. Terminator is yep. a good one where they want to kill humanity. But what about an AI unit that disregards humanity, meaning if it's an evolution, if we look at it as an evolved being, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, and this being is neither good or bad. There's no evil. There's no emotion because emotion is a very biological um, uh, system that we've evolved over over our evolution to interact with other human beings or other members right. of our species and the world around us. But imagine a. What's your thoughts on an AI unit that gets focused on something? For example, we we nurture an AI unit that is focused on looking at the stars and generating power for itself. Right. So in order to generate power for itself, it starts consuming resources. We're immaterial to it. We're not even a resource to it. We're just like a, an antelope out on the plain right. somewhere. You know, we're just like we start building condos over there and eventually the antelopes get pushed off they the side. They just move somewhere else. Yeah, yeah they move <laughs> somewhere else or they just they go extinct. And we really, other than reading a book, they yeah. become a footnote in our history. So I'm, I'm going to take the sun. Yeah. You guys just go somewhere else. I need yeah. all this energy. That, that, right, I mean, right, that's, right. That's, right. And that's why you can't give it too much power too young, just like a child or just like a child emperor or something. You can't give people too much power too young because who knows what they're going to do with it. If an artificial intelligence has the power to do whatever they want, if they have unlimited resources, then we get into the Terminator scenario. We gave it access to nuclear weapons and told it to detect threats. Uh, threats against me? Yeah, you humans suck. You're going down. Like we, <laughs> we, again, it all comes back to how are we going to let it develop? And it was really cool with the AlphaGo Zero thing because they didn't feed it games. They just said, here are the rules. Go at it. What do you come up with? And it became the best. So obviously, we don't have any answers about what that will look like now. But, but it also, that was a good point. It also did something unexpected. Yes, it absolutely. Also, it also, just like the Google auto drive every now and then it'll do something unexpected, unexpected. and it's so complex right you don't know where that come from <laughs> right and, and those inventive moves in the game where'd you come up with that, that that's right and, and so that's why you have to harness it a little bit and unfortunately that's what they do in terminator you know in terminator 3 they try and harness it and there's the computer virus okay release it now it's got everything it, that, exactly. tough things to answer but everything worth thinking about Thank you. so Hello. Hello. Continuing the uh, theme of uh, AI ethics, uh, there have been some academic uh, inquiry into uh, robot ethics. Uh, Ron Arkin, mm -hmm. he, Arkin here at Georgia Tech, been working on uh, this problem for Department of Defense. Okay. There have been some uh, Not papers so far. <laughs> uh, uh, on uh, creating a so-called Kantian machine after Immanuel Kant. Okay. Uh, there have been papers uh, about applying utilitarian ethics, uh, implementing them in AI. Uh, have there been any new developments? Uh, 
Ron Arkin couldn't talk about it for obvious reasons, and I couldn't find a lot more information. <laughs> I didn't look into that either. That sounds very interesting, though. And again, it's something we need to think about is the ethics. And what are we going to be telling AI is OK? If we make this new being, what's OK, what's not OK? Who gets to say what's OK and what's not OK? A judge? Uh, the president? Hopefully not. I mean, it, 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 uh, there's only so many answers we can give. And unfortunately, no, I, I don't have the latest research on that. So are there any more questions? You want to talk about that thing on the screen right there? Hold on, where'd that go? Yeah, look at that. That's weird. That's Sophia, um, a robot that was designed. It's been interviewed by Jimmy Fallon and everything. But if you see this online, this is not artificial intelligence. This is a program in a really freaky package. It, it, whoever's interviewing it gets the script of the interview beforehand and says it's going to answer things like this. It gives some funny answers like, I'm going to kill all the humans and stuff like that. It's not that funny. Um, but it just, I just wanted you guys to see that. It's like, oh, how come you didn't talk about Sophia? It's like, well, because that's not really artificial intelligence. Um, another one I left out was Boston Dynamics. They make these really cool robots. They grew from things that just fell over to things that run up steps and turn around and do backflips. And there is artificial intelligence in there, absolutely. There's pattern recognition for um, forces, action, reaction, um, how do legs work, going up the stairs. And unfortunately, if you give this thing a gun and tell it to shoot over there, it will. There's no artificial intelligence um, there's no sentience in these. There's no consciousness in these. But this is the package that is being made in our world today. So that's why I, I thought this was a very important talk to give, because we're, we're, we're working on the pieces, and we're putting them together. So are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming to my talk on Monday at DragonCon. I'll see you all next year.